Okay. So what needs to happen for a given circuit to operate is that if I have a pair of sequential elements, flip-flops, right, with some combinational logic in between, then we need to have two sets of constraints. One is that the clock the clock to output delay plus the combinational logic delay. plus the setup time on the second flip flop must be less than or equal to the clock cycle period and if there is a skew between the two clocks then that also contributes to the right hand side right and similarly what we need is that the TCQ plus the minimum value of the combinational delay must be greater than the hold time plus s. Okay. So in other words, on the right hand side, we are essentially talking about when is the clock edge arriving on the right side flip flop, the destination flip flop. Okay. And what are the possible problems? Setup time is with respect to the next clock edge. Okay. Because you are essentially doing some computation and you want the data to be ready by the time the next clock edge arrives at the destination flip flop. Okay? As far as whole time is concerned, the destination flip flop still remains the same, it is the next one. But the edge that you are concerned with is the same edge as what you started with. Okay? You do not want the data to go through too fast. It should not go through two flip flops at the same time. Okay? So, effectively what we are saying in other words is, for every pair of flip flops that are present in the circuit, we can do some kind of an analysis like this and come up with all the possible parts that exist from flip flop to flip flop. Find the value for T clock that satisfies all of those constraints. Okay? And the only way that it can satisfy all of the constraints is that it should be greater than the maximum of all the possible left hand side values. Okay? So that business that we have instead of writing out n different constraints and figuring out how to solve them, we have reduced it to a different problem which is finding out what could contribute to the maximum on the left hand side, that is what is the longest path that can exist. Okay? So to understand this a bit better, let us take a specific example okay, and do a complete analysis of the timing associated with that. Okay? So this is a sort of toy circuit, I am not claiming that it has any particular functionality. Right? This is in fact taken from an example that you can find online. The circuit looks something like this. So, like I said, don't worry about what exactly the functionality of the circuit is. It is just some arbitrary set of gates that I have drawn. Okay? I am going to label all the gates with some <coughs> strings so that you, know, you can use that to refer to them. We will call this U1, U2, U3, U4, U5, U6, U7 and U8. Okay. 
and the delays through each of these are again some arbitrary numbers that I am picking. For the two flip flops, T setup is equal to 3 nanoseconds, T hold is equal to 4 nanoseconds, and T C Q is equal to 5 nanoseconds. Okay? So remember, I am not claiming that this is a realistic circuit or that any of these numbers make sense. It does not matter. The point is, how do we do the analysis for a structure like this? Okay? So there are a number of questions that we can ask. Okay? And we need to sort of understand what are the implications of all of these delays on how we exactly analyze the overall structure of this circuit. Okay. Now, one thing of course to keep in mind, U1 and U2, the two flip-flops, their inputs are on the right hand side, the outputs are on the left hand side, right? That should be obvious from the, no sorry, the inputs are on the left hand side, the outputs are on the right hand side. That should be clear from the way that the connections are made, right? The combinational gate outputs, wherever they are connecting to the inputs of the flip-flops, that is the input of the flip-flop. Okay, they are all directional, so even though they are not explicitly labeled D and Q, that should be clear from the context. Okay, so now what do we have? Right? We need to essentially find out what are all the different constraints that we need to satisfy as far as the timing of this particular circuit is concerned. Right? We have some clock which is being applied from outside. The interesting thing over here is the clock itself directly goes through some kind of a buffer, right? And there is a two nanosecond delay before it even enters the main circuit. Okay. Why is this important? Because overall what we can do is something like this. I can draw an outline that covers this entire block like this and say I now have a system which takes a clock input, some x input and y as output. So if I look at this blue box that I have drawn over here, right, that is essentially the bounding box of the rest of my circuit. But effectively as far as I am concerned as a designer, supposing you give that to me as a block and say use this, right, effectively what I am going to see is only those terminals, right, the clock will be applied to whatever is the terminal of that blue box, x will be applied to the input terminal of the blue box, y will come out of the blue box output. I do not know how many flip flops are there inside, I do not know what kind of circuitry is there inside. Right? I still need to be able to say what are the timing characteristics of this entire block as a whole. Okay. So, because of that we will also need to define something called the setup time and hold time with respect to x and y and the clock signal as it is. Okay. So, the question is if I have this detailed knowledge, the white box so to say of what is inside that box, right? inside that bounding box. Can I use that to sort of say what should be the actual setup time of x with respect to the clock and the whole time of x with respect to the clock, the clock to y output delay, right? All of those things can I compute from the circuit structure as I see it over here. Okay. Now what we need to do is we are given this T setup, T hold and T C Q for U1 and U2, that is the individual flip-flops that are inside the circuit. Okay. So, based on that, what are all the constraints that I can straight away write down? I can say that there is a path, for example, which goes from U1 through U4 up to U2. Okay. There is another path which goes from U2 through U3 back to U1. Okay. So, relatively speaking, this is actually a very simple circuit. There are only two parts that start at a register and end at another register. Okay. 
but it doesn't matter how many parts are there, the procedure that I follow is still going to be the same. I need to write down the constraints for all of them and see which one is the greater one, right? So what would that do? Essentially what I would be saying is, the first path goes something like this, u1 through u4 to u2. Okay. So this is the sort of notation that I will use in order to indicate a path. The starting point, all the intermediate nodes and the ending point. Okay. To be more precise, I should probably say u1q because it is from the q output of u1 through u4 right? then to u2d. Okay. In particular, you might even find that because the delay in u4 I have given over here just one number, right? saying that the delay through u4 is what I will in this case 7 nanoseconds. Right? So what does that mean? What does it mean to say that the delay through an AND gate like this is 7 nanoseconds? It means that after both inputs have stabilized, I need to wait for 7 nanoseconds and after that 7 nanosecond interval, I am guaranteeing that the outputs are going to be stable. Okay. So, this is sort of the worst case delay through the AND gate. There is a possibility that depending on whether the transition was from 0 to 1 or from 0, 0 to 1, 1, 0, 1 to 1, 1 and so on, the delays could actually be different. Okay. And the actual value of the delay that I measure might be a little bit less than 7 nanoseconds. In this case, 7 nanoseconds is the worst case. And when I just give you one number as delay for a particular gate, the understanding has to be that in the worst case, after all the inputs have stabilized, so much time needs to pass before the output can be considered guaranteed stable. Okay. So, if that is the case, then essentially what we need to write down is, yeah, so the point over there is, even for U4, you might actually have to specify which input the signal, the path is going through. Okay. Typically for AND gate, the inputs would be labeled A and B. In which case, was the input connected to the input A or the input B? Because there could be different delays from input A to output and from input B to output. Okay? But we are sort of simplifying, we are leaving out those precise labels that we have. We are just saying, okay, I will assume a constant delay for a gate irrespective of which input it is connected to and so on. Okay? Alright, so U1, U4, U2, what is the delay through it? TCQ plus the delay through U4 plus the T setup at U2. Okay. So this is 5 nanoseconds plus 7 plus 3. Okay. In other words, 15 nanoseconds as the path delay from U1 to U2. Okay. Similarly, there is another path which goes from U2 back to U1 passing through U3. Over here it is 5 nanoseconds TCQ plus 8 for U3 plus 3 or 16 nanoseconds. Okay. Is there any other path in this circuit which starts at a register and ends at a register? What about something which goes from U1 through U4, then U2, U3 and back to U1? Is that a valid path? So, U1, U4, U2, U3, U1, right, is not something that we are concerned about. Why? Because at some point in between, we are hitting a register in the middle. Okay? So, U1 to U4 to U2 to U3 to U1 is not a timing path. Right? 
Why do I say that? Because why are we writing down all of these constraints? We know that the clock is undergoing transitions at specific instants of time. Okay? And all that we care about is how should the clock essentially become sort of, how should we manage the clock period so that no constraints are violated. Right? In this case, what happens is I go from U1, I reach U2, whatever delay I got until then will now wait until the clock ends. It's not as if it can straight away go through U2 and continue. Okay? So in other words, I cannot just say okay, U1 PCQ plus U uh, plus U4 some combinational delay plus U2 setup time plus U2 TCQ that doesn't make sense, right? Because once I have hit the setup time of U2, I now need to wait until the next clock ends before anything can come out of U2. Okay? So this is not something that I need to concern myself about. Okay? So please keep that in mind. Every year, in fact, I usually find somebody or other saying that there is a path which passes through an extra set of registers in the middle. Right? Be very clear, that is not a timing path that you need to concern yourself about. Because the moment you hit a register, an edge triggered register, everything sort of stops until the next clock edge. Okay, it's a barrier. Right? Everything comes up to there, stops, and after the next clock edge, data will then continue to sort of propagate through the system. Okay? So, as far as we can see now, there are only these two parts that we need to be concerned about. And if I try to write down the clock period, then what would it be? What is the minimum clock period that I can use on this system? 16 nanoseconds, right? Okay? But there is one additional problem. Okay. There are some other parts in this circuit that I also need to be concerned about. Okay, and I need to make sure that I take all of them into account. Right? Those parts are specifically from input, I have a path directly going through to the output. Okay? Is that something that I need to worry about as far as timing is concerned? We need to think about it and understand that clearly. Right? Similarly, from input, there is a path which goes up to a flip-flop. Okay? There is also another path which starts at a flip-flop and goes through to output. In fact, there are two such paths. Okay? So, all of these are also things that we probably need to concern ourselves with. Why is that? To understand exactly what happens in such a situation, let's look at that blue box that we drew around the circuit to start with, right? Supposing that is now my circuit. This is x, this is y, and this is the clock. How is this particular circuit that I have designed over here going to be used in a larger system? Right? The way that digital design typically works is that you don't try and design your entire circuit at one shot. What you do is you design modules, right? An arithmetic and logic unit. Before that, an adder, right? Maybe a register file, maybe a comparator to use somewhere, or a multiplexer for some use. You design each of those individually. You characterize that block as a module in itself, right? and then start integrating these modules with other blocks. So this is the previous and this is the next block. Okay? What will typically happen is this will also have a clock, this will also have a clock, right? Which means that there is a possibility that I have some path starting from here and ending at a register over here. Okay, starting from some register sitting inside this. And similarly, there might be something else which starts over here and ends at a register over here. Or there might be a path which starts from a register here, passes through this combinational logic and comes through directly to another register. So all these three combinations are also possible the moment that you start using your system in a larger design. 
okay so when you talk about what is the maximum clock period that can be uh, minimum clock period that can be used on a system you also need to concern yourself with what are the other parts not only the register to register parts that are inside the circuit that you are building okay so let's look at our circuit more closely and see if that is in fact going to be a problem right so what do we have over here let us look at the green parts first right there are two of them one essentially goes right through okay it's a combinational circuit okay so what is the combinational delay that we have over here the path is u7 u5 and u6 with a delay of 1 plus 9 plus 6 right so u7 u5 u6 16 nanoseconds okay what does it mean for the red curve that i've drawn at the top over there it means that if i'm using this as part of a larger system the previous stage will have some flip flop that is generating an output which is feeding into x that will have some tcq it will add 16 nanoseconds delay through this block plus the t setup of wherever it is going next so most likely if i am trying to use the same clock for the entire system 16 nanoseconds is not good enough right my previous calculation said that 16 nanoseconds is good enough it will satisfy all my constraints within my block but the moment i try using this block in a larger circuit it seems to indicate that 16 nanoseconds may not be good enough okay what about the other delays from x to u2 there is a path right so u7 u4 u2 this essentially has a delay of 1 through u7 7 through u4 and the setup time of u2 11 nanoseconds okay this is not a problem okay what about the brown curves that we have a brown parts that we have over here from Ah yes yes, good good point. Thank you. So there is in fact one more path over here, which goes through like this. Okay. So what does the second green curve look like? So that is X U seven U three U one. One plus in this case the delay of U three is eight. plus setup time of u1 is 3 so 12 nanoseconds yeah ha huh? well, we don't know whether it is a problem yet but look at this part over here right the one that i marked in brown at the top imagine that your module right the one that we have over here right is being used as part of a larger design okay now what happens when you put it into a larger design it has some input x it has some output y where is that x coming from from some other module which was feeding into it there is y going to some other module okay from where is the input coming to x inside that previous module there must have been some flip flop plus some logic okay which would have its own delay some t at, at the very least it would have a tcq associated with it okay on the destination side the y is then going through some t setup before it reaches a flip flop both of those will add on top of the 16 that you already have so if i'm trying to use the same clock for all three modules right i will almost certainly have a problem because i cannot use 16 nanoseconds anymore i will also have to add the setup time on the destination and the tcq on the source sorry ha ah. it is independent but it's using the same clock so that level of dependence is there you are trying to use the same clock on all three modules right as long as you try to use the same clock the question becomes what is the clock period that can be safely used 
that's all okay now although i am saying that this x to u2 and x to u1 paths are you know only 11 nanoseconds and 12 nanoseconds so they are not a problem keep in mind that when i am doing the analysis i actually need to do a full analysis let's say that i start from here and i end at this point right i should actually consider what is the delay starting from the flip flop inside the previous source module until its output then take the delay from x up to u1 or u2 whichever one is larger okay so on the previous stage if the delay was more than let's say 4 nanoseconds right it would mean that as far as the clock is concerned i will have a situation where i actually need to say look i need to wait more than this much time before getting data into this okay the last set of parts that we need to concern ourselves with are the brown parts marked over here which are input and from the flip flop to the output okay there are two of them u1 u5 u6 and u2 u5 u6 So effectively what we have is now there are delays which are going from the start of a flip flop going to the output of the circuit which are now greater than the 16 nanoseconds which was a register to register delay that we had. Okay. Now having said all of this there is one slight catch which I have not mentioned clearly over here. For so these two sets of parts the ones terminating at the register and the ones which are starting from the register. T C Q. Why do we take T setup? Because we have T C Q as minus two. Oh, sorry, minus two. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So both of these should be five. So it's twenty. Okay. That's not the end of the story. There is one more thing which I have ignored while doing these four calculations. What is that? Huh? U8, the clock skew. Okay. So what what does that mean? Right? Go back to this system level diagram that we have over here. I am saying that the clock is arriving here at the input of my boundary of my system, let us say at time 0. Okay? Then I draw a system diagram like this and I draw that the same clock is being used for all of them. Right? What I normally mean is, I will take some time 0 as the time when the clock reaches the system boundary for each of my modules. When does the clock actually reach the flip flops? inside my module at least at time 2 2 nanoseconds right? because there is some clock skew over here which says that there is a 2 nanosecond delay before the clock which has hit the boundary of my blue box actually hits the flip flops ok so the correct analysis that I will need to run over here is for x right from the point that x reaches the boundary of my module until the time that it reaches the input of the flip flop is 11 nanoseconds 
when does the clock reach the flip flop only at 2 ok so with respect to the outside clock right the delay is only 9 nanoseconds ok in other words I can apply x up to 9 nanoseconds before the outside clock right it will take 9 nanoseconds it will take 11 nanoseconds to actually reach the flip flop that I have over here it will take in this case 11 nanoseconds to reach the input of u2 but the clock itself will also take 2 nanoseconds to reach the input of u2 therefore effectively the fact that the clock is delayed is giving me some extra freedom on the input side why am I concerned with this once again go back to the system level diagram to understand that that blue the green line that I have drawn over there right the x to input delay will effectively be how much is the delay that I am encountering inside the system that I need to essentially leave a margin for if the clock itself is getting delayed inside the system that helps me ok so effectively what I have in other words is these two will become reduced what happens to the other two for them it is worse right the clock itself is arriving late after that there is a TCQ and the combinational logic delay until it reaches the output so the clock arriving late at the flip flops actually makes my when I look at it from a system point of view from the time that the clock edge arrives at this CLK pin how much time does it take for the output to arrive over there it takes 2 nanoseconds for the clock to reach the flip flop then 5 nanoseconds for the data to come out of the flip flop plus 9 nanoseconds through U5 6 nanoseconds through U6 right so a total of 22 nanoseconds instead of 20 so it gets worse ok so on the output side it becomes plus 2 ok overall in other words when you are reporting the timing for a circuit right in general you do not know where that circuit is going to be used you know that you are designing it as a module but you cannot say for sure whether you are going to connect it with, to a system with the same clock or with a clock has that has some amount of skew right or maybe some slightly phase shifted version of the clock so because of that rather than just saying okay 22 nanoseconds there is a 22 nanosecond delay I can't do anything about it right what if my next stage had a 5 nanosecond skew on the clock or a 6 nanosecond skew on the clock that would actually help me right just like the skew helped on the input side over here that made it worse on the output side if my destination module also had a 6 nanosecond skew on the input side then that would effectively mean that my x to input delay would go down by 6 nanoseconds over there so because of that while reporting timing typically what you find is that four different numbers are mentioned right this is the register to register path delay maximum ok and usually the frequency of operation is 1 over the register to register delay ok but the other numbers also need to get reported but you can make sense of them only in the context of a larger system what are the other numbers register to output input to register and direct input to out output combinational path ok sometimes this is also called a pin ok 
So these are sometimes called the pin to pin delays or the pin to register delays or the register to pin delays. Okay? Because we effectively treat those as the actual pins or the external ports corresponding to the module that you are designing. Okay? So when you are designing a system and you are trying to characterize it for timing to find out what is the maximum speed it can run at, you actually need to consider all four of these elements separately. You cannot just get one maximum and say this is it. This is the delay corresponding to my circuit. Why? Because it depends on how you are using it. You could have a large register to output delay for example, right? But if you are then connecting it to another module which is using a phase shifted version of the clock, you might find that everything actually falls in place. You do not have a problem with it because the clock itself arrives delayed for the next system. Okay. So, what is the summary of all of this? If you are doing it by hand, right? if you need to do hand calculations, you can pretty much do it only for relatively small circuits, right? where you can sort of enumerate all the parts that you have. You pretty much proceed the way that we have done over here. Right? Look at all the possible combinational parts, whether they start at a register, end at a register, start at a register, go through to output and so on. Right, all those combinations. Right, find out which is the maximum among the register to register parts that determines your clock frequency. The other parts may determine your clock frequency depending on how you use them in the context of the larger system. Okay, but for industrial level designs where you are dealing with like thousands of gates, it's pretty much impossible to do this by enumerating all the possible paths, right? There is a simple way that you can understand that, right? Supposing I have some n flip-flops in a circuit, right? What is the maximum possible number of register to register paths? This is not actually sufficient information even to answer that because you, it's not just determined by the number of flip flops or the registers, it also depends on the number of combinational gates. Right? So for example, if I have just one pair of flip flops, right? what is the maximum possible number of paths that can be there between them? It depends on how the gates are connected. Right? So I am going to draw a particularly bad example. Supposing I have a gate which essentially says fans out to two other gates. Okay? That in turn combines into another one. That once again fans out into two more gates. Combines. Okay? Repeat this many times until you reach this one. Now every one of these, this is a path, this is another path, this is a third path, this is a fourth path. Right? What is the number of parts that I can have over here? 2 to the power of whatever, k where k is the number of stages. Okay? This is a pathological example, right? I mean it is not going to happen in real life. My point over here is just to say that the number of parts can potentially be exponential or even worse. Okay, I mean definitely it's sort of multiplicative in the number of elements that are there in between. Okay? In terms of computational complexity, what that means is, generally speaking, right, for those of you who have done a course in basic algorithms, we know that anything where the number of parts or number of items to be checked is polynomial is generally considered acceptable. Right? So something which is n or n square or n cube right, is typically considered acceptable because by sufficiently fast growing computational power you will always be able to handle it. But anything which grows as a constant power n is an exponential growth, it is considered intractable meaning that with computing power, the way the computing power grows, it will not be possible to really catch up with it and handle large circuits in a reasonable amount of time. Okay? This is an example where 
very trivially what we can see is that the number of such paths can grow exponentially so enumerating all possible paths is impractical right that does not mean the problem itself is hard all that means is enumerating them and trying to find out the maximum path is a bad idea it turns out there are much better and simpler algorithms which actually give you the optimal answer right you can actually find out what is the maximum of the longest path between this pair of registers without enumerating all of them okay so all of that essentially takes us into this area called timing analysis right typically what this entire thing is called is static timing analysis right so this static has nothing to do with the static cmos or dynamic logic gates that we were talking about earlier that referred to whether or not the there are any floating nodes in the circuit okay we don't care about that we are considering static timing analysis in the sense that we are not actually worried about what are the actual transitions that take place inside the circuit in other words we do not care about what is the input that is applied and how it propagates through the circuit right what we are saying is i am going to consider worst case delays and propagate that through the circuit under all possible conditions okay now one last piece of information so this is essentially the problem of static timing analysis for small circuits you can you now know how to do it by hand for large circuits you cannot do that business of enumerating all possible paths but there are good algorithms that are known to do it okay some of you may have heard of this conference called the tau workshop which essentially deals with timing analysis exclusively okay they have they typically run a timing analysis contest every year right so for those of you who are interested in programming or in design automation algorithms you can look it up the contest for this year has just been announced a few days back okay so what happens in the tau timing contest is that typically you are given some kind of a more complex version of this problem right what we discussed is the very minimum basic detail now when you start including things like okay you know which pin of the input to which pin of the gate to which pin of the output how much is the delay under what conditions what happens when the capacitor load changes right if you start taking all of those into account it turns out that the problem becomes a little bit more complex but the basic ideas remain the same okay iit madras had in fact participated in three of the contests like up to i think last year last year we did not participate but the previous three years there were participation and we had placed within the top 3 in each case right so it's i think something nice to work towards we in fact if somebody is interested we have some kind of a working code base that you can build upon or you can of course develop your own code whichever way that it works out right this year's problem i think is on the problem of timing macro modeling so what is macro modeling essentially what it says is so far we have talked about how you can implement timing analysis for individual gates but when you try doing that for larger circuits let's say for an adder or an accumulator or a multiplier or something like that right there are just too many parts and too many sort of intermediate stages that you need to worry about you need some better way by which you can model the timing at that larger scale okay there are models that are built for that the contest itself is about how efficiently can you compute those parameters okay so for those of you who are interested i would suggest that you look that up just search for tau workshop timing contest okay the information is available online they usually give fairly detailed instructions on how to go about doing this so even if you are you know though, even though you are not completed the course you are already in a position to sort of work on that and in fact even people who are not done the course can sort of make some progress on something like that although this knowledge will help you okay all right so we'll stop here for now